Uh, welcome everyone. You, we are so happy to, to see you so numerous here. Uh, I'm Laura Convertino. I'm an academic clinical fellow at King's College London. Um, I'm also the president of Science for Democracy. Science for Democracy is an association that was born in 2018 with the purpose of uh, promoting the right to science as a human right worldwide. Um, we have the pleasure today to welcome you on behalf of Science for Democracy, Associazione Luca Goscioni and Humans, who are three sister associations that are working together with very similar goals. Um, this webinar has been organized by um, mainly, let's say, with the, with the help of Cesare Romano, who is our Secretary General, and is going to be starting soon um, with, the first, with the first part. Um, now, I would just like to say before we start that during the, the presentation, you're going to, the different presentations and uh, talks, you're going to listen um, to a lot of interesting things about the right to science. However, there is much more to know and much more to do. Uh, so if you are interested in joining us, if you're interested in supporting our activities, if you're interested in just in getting to know more about it, I would invite you to um, register to, to our mailing list and to visit our websites. And we're always happy to answer to more questions if you want to reach out directly to us. Uh, Julia, I know that you are sharing our link. Thank you so much in the general chat. So for anyone who is interested in getting to know more about it, uh, you're very welcome to, to do so. Um, as I was mentioning today, we're going to have uh, wonderful speakers. Um, I will briefly introduce um, the names and then we go a bit deeper into details later. We're going to hear from uh, Cesare Romano, who is Professor of Law uh, and Director of the International Human Rights Center, Loyola Law School, Los Angeles, and Secretary General of Science for Democracy. He's also the co-author with Andrea Boggio of the newly published book, The Human Right to Science, and we, we're going to hear a little bit about it in a second. We're going to have Michael Mancisidor, who is Professor of International Law at the University of Deusto. He's also a member of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. We'll then move to Yvonne Donders, who is Professor of International Human Rights Law, University of Amsterdam, a member of the UN Human Rights Committee. Um, we also have with us El Porsdam, who is Professor of History and Cultural Rights and UNESCO Chair in Cultural Rights, University of Copenhagen. We'll hear from Monica Plotza, Senior Research Associate and Lecturer, University of Lucerne. And finally, we'll close with Andrea Boggio, who is Professor of Legal Studies and Fellow of the Center for Health and Behavioral Science, Bryant University. He's not here with us right now, but he's going to join in a minute. Um, Marco Perduca will also join us uh, in a moment. He's a member of the Board of Directors of Science for Democracy and one of the key members of Associazione Luca Coscioni, and he's going to uh, co-chair with me today. Again, welcome all. Um, so happy to see you. And I'm going to leave the floor to Cesare Romano for the first part of our work webinar. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I say good morning because I'm speaking from uh, California right now. And uh, thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with everyone. And uh, most of all, to be here with my friends and colleagues uh, with whom uh, we have shared a quite a long journey in the past, I'd say 10 or 12 years uh, on, uh, on the discovery and the development of the right to science. And actually, with when Andrea joins us, probably we're going to have <laughs> on this panel <laughs> basically everyone who has written something about it all in one shot. Um, so we are here. The prompts are two for today. Well, the reason we're having the webinar on this day, uh, it's uh, which is because it was the uh, yearly celebration for the World uh, Day of Science. Uh, the official name is World Science Day for Peace and Development. Uh, the United Nations um, designates some days um, as a catalyst to celebrate um, certain things or call the attention. And we thought it was very um, uh, fitting uh, to have a webinar on the future of the right to science on this day. The second prompt is the recent publication of this tome that just came out with Oxford University Press. It's quite a break at 900 pages. Um, so if you need a door stopper, you can definitely order it. <laughs> uh, on the, actually, uh, on the page of invitation, I think there is a discount code that can be used to get it like 30% or 40% uh, discount. The book uh, has been a long work in for seven years that I co-authored it together with Andrea Boggio. It's a completely um, co-authored project. And uh, 
we we wrote it because it's basically stemmed from our personal frustration of uh, very often encountering this mysterious thing called the right to science, but actually not having quite a good understanding of what the normative content of the book is. So as a way of introduction, and so that I uh, make sure that all our audience understands what we're talking about when we talk about the right to science, let me say a few words about this right. Of course, all our speakers today here are the most knowledgeable plan people on the planet about it, but you know, I cannot assume the same from, from everyone else. Um, so the human right to science is one of the oldest internationally recognized human rights. The, it can be traced back to the first international human rights document, which is the American uh, Declaration of Human Rights. From there, it got incorporated at the universal level in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And from there, it made the jump into one of the two key covenants of the international human rights architecture, which is the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And it's incorporated in Article 15 of the Covenant. So uh, despite the fact that it has one very long heritage and very deep roots to the very beginning of human rights, for much of its history, the human rights to science was one of the least discussed, the least understood, uh, the least complied with of all international human rights. But in the past 15, say, to 20 years, the human rights to science has come back to the center and front of the stage. Um, a lot of developments have helped bringing it to the forefront. Also, a lot of activities of people. Uh, Michael Manchisidor, who's here with us today, has been the leading force behind the writing of General Common 25, by the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which exactly explained the normative content of the right to science. So it's thanks to the work both as an academic, as a practitioner of Mikkel, but also the work of uh, Ele as an academic, of Yvonne in both capacity as an academic practitioner, was Monica, that finally this right now is taking shape and has, as far as I'm concerned, a bright future. Uh, I'm super excited about it because the potentials of its application in a wide range of human activities is enormous, and we just barely start tapping it. Um, actually, just before I came on this webinar, I was working on a case, actually communication, that's a technical term uh, that is used within the United Nations. Um, that will raise a claim of a violation of Article 15 of the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So, of course, this is a long shot. It will take years for the communication to work its way through the process. There are many issues, but should it work, then it will give the opportunity to the committee to say something more about the content of this right. Now, I would like to pull up uh, a diagram for a second um, because the human right to science as every human right, it's a complex bundle of more discrete and specific rights. You know, for instance, when we say everyone has the right to fair trial, yes, that's clear, but what exactly does it mean, right? How do you break it down? And it breaks down to a right to have an attorney, to a right to be brought before a court promptly, to the right to have trial translated if you don't speak the language, and so on and so forth does the right to science break down into? So together with Andrea in the book, we identify at least 22 sub rights within the larger family of the right to science. And for sake of simplicity, we group them in four groups, which we call one, the right to scientific progress. The second one is the right to responsible scientific progress. The third one is the right to participate in scientific progress. And the fourth is the right to benefit from scientific progress. All right, so under each of these headings, there is specific singular rights. Some of these rights are mostly concerned and are mostly benefiting the scientists themselves and exist to enable scientists to do their work. Other rights actually benefit the general public and include everyone. For instance, the right to, um, to the development of beneficial applications, which is right number 20 here on the bottom right, applies to everyone. Um, some rights are 
translate well into the corresponding obligations that states have. And in the book, we have tried to break it down. We also tried to come up with a series of indicators that could be used um, to measure either progress or regress from the fulfillment of, of these specific rights. Um, as you see, there is a lot, right? And again, it took 900 pages uh, to really to start describing the contours of this. But of course, the journey is not over. There's like much more that can be said, much more that needs to be said and done uh, to fulfill the right to science and to turn it into a reality. So in the last chapter of the book, and here is the segue to the next speaker, uh, we have, Andrea and I, we have sketched a few ideas of where the right to science might go. Um, some of these are practical. Uh, one idea that we have is that we have noticed that uh, in general, the international uh, legal landscape, um, all treaties that deal with science or scientific matters approach science from a point of view of fear, right? They exist to put limits to what scientists can do, but not actually to enable scientists to do their work. Uh, we believe that it's important at this point in history to come up with a very strong statement on, by states where they recommit and commit themselves to support science, to open it, to remove barriers to it, to finance it, to fund it, and do all the things that science needs to do to thrive. Right? And in the book, we propose the negotiation and eventual adoption of a treaty on science to do exactly many of those things. Uh, but of course, that's a far-flung idea, right? Who knows? Maybe it will take a decade, maybe it will take 20 years, maybe I will even die before I will see that happening. Maybe it will never happen at all, right? And of course, we are not, um, uh, we are not naive in thinking that yet another treaty is going to resolve, uh, you know, all issues. Um, but we think it's a good starting point. And it's a, if you want, a capping stone of a long journey that started on December 31st, 1945, which is the day in which the, draft, the, the minutes of the first draft of the American Declaration of Human Rights were adopted and has brought us today to November 11th, 2014 um, to talk about it. All right, so with this, Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing this slide. Of course, um, you will find more information about this on the website of Science for Democracy um, and uh, in the book itself, of course. And now let me pass the word back to Laura. Thank you so much, Chitter. It was a wonderful introduction to the right to science. Uh, I think it already gave a lot of information to, to the audience. Um, we now, I think we're now ready to move to our next speaker with Mikhail Mancisidor. Uh, as I said before, uh, Mikhail is professor of international law at the University of Deusto. Um, is member of the UN Committee on Social Economic, on, on, sorry, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, and as Cesare said, is one of the key uh, figure um, for the promotion of the um, human right to science internationally. Uh, we were very happy to have him here. Uh, Mikhail, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. It's uh, really my pleasure and my honor to be the, here in this uh, roundtable with uh, with you. Have to thank uh, the, the the organizers for for organizing this uh, event in the in the context of the World Day for for science for for peace and uh, development. I have plenty of things to to uh, thank for to to science for democracy and Luca Cozzone uh, Associazione. Uh, they because they, they both have been uh, or were key uh, in the in the consequence in the consequence of uh, the 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 the, uh, the adoption uh, in the successful adoption of the general comment on science and. Uh, I'm uh, very, very pleased uh, to be here uh, in the framework for the presentation of uh, this uh, tremendous uh, uh, book on uh, not only by the, uh, its dimension, but uh, by at, uh, mainly uh, by its uh, quality, this 
a new book by the Fessari and Borgio uh, that is um, extremely enriching, is uh, enlightening, uh, that, uh, and is uh, with new ideas inspiring about uh, human rights uh, to science. This uh, book is going to 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 to, uh, to be necessary and a key in any biography on uh, human rights to science, all together with the, 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 the previous book by Helen Porsdam or the pioneering uh, war uh, uh, by the, uh, Yvonne Dornbeers. Uh, so, uh, as you can uh, see, I have plenty of uh, reasons to be happy to be here and uh, but uh, let's go to the to the content because uh, I have just uh, 10 minutes and I I, I should go to the uh, to the to the content um, uh, in a very direct manner so uh, thank you very much Fesari, for the, your uh, presentation that helps us to enter directly to the to the court uh, issues and uh, just this uh, human right to to, to science, um so or uh, permits us to to imagine a lot of contents uh, in the intersections of the two main ideas main uh, two main concepts um enshrined in the uh, uh, human right to science i mean participation and benefit from the participation in doing science or participation in science and benefiting from uh, the science. For examples, I'm not going to 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 end any list, but just a, a few examples. Um, the access to knowledge means protection uh, for, for for people, protection from pseudosciences, uh, protection for from from fake uh, science. Uh, participation means promotion of uh, citizen science. Um, Benefit from science mean, means a lot of things, but uh, among uh, other, the right of all of us uh, to, 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 uh, for the governments to take their decision based on the best scientific knowledge um, uh, available. Uh, we shouldn't forget um, uh, about the role of science in uh, creating the conditions for 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 for, for being uh, for, for a better citizenship or for 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 for, for, for building a better democracy uh, among um, all uh, citizens. Okay, if we uh, uh, I, I I can't uh, um, I'm I'm in line with the the first idea uh, where we, we I'm reacting to the last chapter of this book, the chapter that is uh, titled The Future of the Right to Science. And I, I'm going to take the opportunity to underline a couple of ideas and to add some ideas by my own. Uh, the first, uh, I can't uh, not be more in favor with the, with the, uh, with the authors that uh, now it's time to translate the, 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 the human right to, to science into the standards of conduct. I appreciate very much and I thank you very much the authors of this uh, book for the central role they paid or they have uh, given to the general the comment that has been uh, uh, cited. But I agree that uh, this is not uh, no more the moment in the repeating the content of the, the, of the uh, general comment but to try to translate the general comment on the, on the standards of, of and practice. Uh, and, in, and in order to do the, so, um, we have add or we have uh, to, 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 to count with many, uh, many actors, both from the domestic uh, level, from the, the, from, from the, 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 the state, from the, the domestic uh, law, and from international uh, uh, level or international uh, law. For example, from an uh, international uh, arena, from the international organizations, uh, take the, 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 the example of uh, UNESCO. I'm going to share with you a presentation. I'm sorry, where are you? Uh, Sorry, just a second. I lost my presentation. That is here. 
Yes, it's here. Okay, the, the role of uh, UNESCO is uh, key. The, 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 the last chapter of the of the book uh, the remain, uh, reminds us that uh, UNESCO has uh, adopted several standard setting instruments that incorporate and uh, apply the right to science principles. And uh, uh, I could uh, uh, give you an example of, of, of this. And we can compare uh, the, 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 the what happened with uh, the, the the right right to to, to water uh, almost uh, twenty years ago, and now with the right to to, to science. In uh, uh, six uh, seven years after the the the, uh, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights adopted the general comment on uh, on, the, on the right to to to, to water. Uh, UNESCO uh, decided uh, to focus all the programs on the basis or with a focus on the human right to water. Something similar, in a more the prudent and modest way, but something similar can, can in, 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 a, in a very similar line can be understood. Uh, the new uh, the approach uh, adopted in uh, 2022. Uh, Oh, yeah, uh, this uh, UNESCO brief on the right to science and uh, COVID-19 decided to refer to, to, to this general comment to define its uh, science policy regarding uh, COVID-19. You, you can read uh, here, UNESCO general uh, comment, uh, the, the, greatest, the greater normative clarity offered by the groundbreaking uh, general comment on science uh, uh, and economic, social and cultural right adopted by the, the committee. This is an example uh that uh, reflects that uh, the, the 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 general uh, comment cannot be just uh, an interesting tool for the committee cannot be just an interesting tool for 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 the office of the high commission of human rights but also for all uh, international organizations for example uh, unesco but let's have another example from a uh, uh, domestic law uh, look at this. The uh, paragraph um, eleven of the of this uh, general comment uh, recalls or reminds the the, the, the the article fifteen of the covenant, but identifies that this article and the the, the universal the, the article the the, uh, the the universal the declaration did the, the very same had two ideas. Look at this: the right to participate and to write to enjoy the benefits this is one of the most important points of the of the of the of the general comment okay if if you you have uh, here in spanish the very same uh, paragraph 11 por lo tanto se trata de un derecho a participar uh, right to take part and to gozar de los beneficios enjoy the benefits why i am sharing with you the spanish version because I want to say you uh, to 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 show you that this uh, very same wording has been adopted by a constitution, uh, the the constitution of the federal uh, the, the state of, uh, of of Mexico City. Uh, look at uh, here. Um, this is a law. I'm sorry. Uh, the. Um, uh, La Ley General de Materia de Ciencias, the Science of Law of uh, Mexico. And you have here the law uh, focus on an explanation, on a definition of uh, the right to science that, that is exactly the definition given by the uh, general uh, comment uh, one year before. The, this law is from uh, 2023. So that means a uh, year after the adoption of general comment. And you can see, toda persona eh, tiene derecho a participar en la ciencia y gozar de sus beneficios. You have here the very same idea, to take part and to enjoy. You can uh, see that the, the scheme of the, the, um, the general uh, comment can be, can be translated to many domestic instruments programs, plans, norms, reglaments, law, and even uh, the constitutions.
the document uh, the, the, the chapter gives us more inspiring uh, ideas uh, the for example the idea to have a new mandate by the council of human rights on the right to science i cannot be more in favor of this uh, uh, idea i'll uh, deal with uh, it uh, uh, very briefly later uh, the, uh, the this chapter i'm finishing i'm ending um underlined the, the role of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in, um, in, the, in, 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 in monitoring these uh, rights. I cannot be more in favor. But I tell you, um, I want to add some, uh, some uh, tip or some information to these uh, paragraphs. The committee needs your help in order to fulfill its mandate to monitor the, the fulfillment of the states of these um, the, the obligations based on this uh, human right to to help needs the help of the of the civil society civil society needs to bring a good question needs, needs to, to 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 bring a good report in order for the the, the committee to fulfill its mandate in a, in a very correct manner so of course, this the the the, the, the obligation. The, the, I, I read now from the, this paragraph. The committee must ensure that proper consideration is given to the obligation codified in Article 15. Again, 100% uh, in, in favor. But please, we need the help of the civil society in, in doing it uh, well. Last uh, idea. Uh, this chapter finished the, with the idea. Cesar has mentioned uh, uh, it of a, a new um, the possibility of, of having or a new a treaty on, on science led or yes by uh, UNESCO. And we have here two uh, two main uh, um, uh, two main um, ideas. First, the idea of creating a new mandate by the council and second the idea of having UNESCO leading a, a new uh, treaty. I uh, I don't think that we should choose one or another. I think that are both are compatible and are not uh, uh, they are not uh, parallel. They are touching and reaching each other. Uh, the chapter mentions the, the example of uh, raggy principles and the the, the, the key role of uh, of raggy principles on the matter of uh, of the issue of business and human rights in order to have better standards and perhaps this new uh, mandate uh, holder could uh, provide us with uh, some uh, guiding principles on, on on the human rights to science that could um, uh, organize the guidelines for the, this hopefully hopefully new um, treaty on uh, science. A final uh, idea, uh, so, uh, mention it, this uh, chapter, um, I mentioned that uh, many, many times, too many times, uh, the, the issue of science in relation to human rights has been uh, tackled or has been considered from uh, the position of fear. I'm not going to say that we have to take the position of celebration, but at least the position of opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mikel. Thank you for, for your uh, input. It's incredibly uh, beneficial to us all, I think, uh, and brings a lot of useful points of, of uh, reflection. Uh, before moving to our next speaker, I just would like to first of all remind our attendees that if they have any question, they can write in the Q&A. We're going to take questions at the end so we can have a moment of, of discussion. I would also like to welcome Marco Perduca, who just joined us in the panel in the panelist um, group. Marco was uh, the president of Science for Democracy before me, is a founder member of Science for Democracy, is now a member of the board of directors and is a former Italian uh, senator who has been working for a long time in the human rights uh, field. He will uh, take over from me as a chair uh, just after our next speaker. Um, our next speaker, it's my true pleasure to introduce Yvonne Donders, a professor of international human rights law at the University of Amsterdam and member of the UN Human Rights uh, Committee. Uh, Yvonne is another world expert on the right to science. Uh, we are thrilled to have her here. And Yvonne, I leave the floor to you. Thank you so much for joining us.
Thank you very, very much. And uh, as was already said, it is really a pleasure to be with so many friends, colleagues, who have been working so hard on the right to science in this uh, in this webinar, and it's great that you've managed to organize it. Um, so let me first of all, indeed, thank Andrea and Romano, and congratulate them actually on this wonderful, wonderful book. I mean, it's truly bringing the work and the discussions of the last decade that many of us were following together. But what I like about it, it's really not a descriptive work. It goes much further in identifying where we need to make progress and move beyond the existing works. Now, two topics that I would like to address here in, in the time that is given to me are monitoring and justiciability. Mikkel also already alluded to some of them. Now, to quote the authors in their final chapter, um, they say implementation monitoring is critical to ensure the full realization of the right to science. And I should tell you that these both authors have always emphasized the importance of monitoring and not merely for the purpose of ensuring compliance by states, but also as a tool for further elaboration of the concepts in these provisions. So in other words, sort of monitoring to clarify and potentially develop our understanding of the rights and obligations implied by the right to science. Now, the book, of course, addresses treaty monitoring and the possibility to address these issues in, for instance, uh, state reports. And I again quote the authors. We believe the right to science must be more prominently featured during the review of states' implementation of their obligations. End of quote. And they focus hereby on the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And this is, of course, understandable, and Hell has perfectly outlined that, since the right to science features so prominently in that treaty. However, as a member of one of the other treaty bodies, I would like to point at the possibilities of the other covenant, the one on civil and political rights. So this treaty, so the treaty, the covenant on civil and political rights, in my view, offers a lot of entry points actually to discuss the right to science, even if this right is not explicit in this treaty. And the Human Rights Committee, the body of independent experts monitoring the treaty of which I am a member, has dealt with several aspects and should in my view do this much more often. And why it is so interesting to use the other covenant as well is because for instance, the Human Rights Committee does not so much suffer from the fact that the right to science often comes last in the review order because it's at the end of the treaty in the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. For the ICCPR, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it's part of many provisions, such as the right to freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of association, the prohibition of arbitrary arrest and detention, and these are just a few. So in my view, we should start seeing academics, not merely as professionals in the scientific and educational field, but also as potential human rights defenders. And their work in teaching and research, sometimes questioning or criticizing policies of the state, should therefore be also protected as such. Now, one of the challenges that we see is that academics are often overlooked when it comes to their rights. and They're not often seen as human rights defenders. They're not well represented in civil society organizations because sometimes they're considered to be an elite who can take care of themselves and who do not need specific protection. Now, I can inform you that during our last session, which just finished last week, uh, the Human Rights Committee had the dialogue with, amongst others, Turkey. And during these dialogues, we asked states questions about their report, based on their own state report, but also about information that we obtain by civil society organizations and by UN bodies. And that information by civil society organizations is very crucial, as Mikkel also already pointed out. It's crucial to get a full picture of the situation in the state 
and all the human rights issues in that particular state. Now, in this case, there were several testimonies of academics in Turkey who were fired, arrested, harassed, or otherwise where their human rights were limited or infringed. And we therefore integrated concerns on these issues and recommendations in our so-called concluding observations in the case of Turkey under the headings of freedom of movement, due process, and human rights defenders. But in order to do this more often and more frequently and more substantively, we need civil society organizations and academics themselves to come forward and to provide the treaty bodies with information on violations of the right to science under these different headings. Now, another important aspect that I see in these dialogues is data and data collection. So many states do not have good statistics or data on science, and certainly not in the disaggregated way that we would like to see it. So it's a real challenge for many states, especially larger ones or those with less resources. And here I would also like to echo what the authors of the book have said. So to say that international organizations such as UNESCO, but also the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights should play a role in capacity building and training because that's important to gather those data and get the numbers and the indicators in picture. Now, apart from the state reporting, we of course, as Human Rights Committee also receive individual communications. We deal with individual cases. And it's also very important to have more cases at this international level on the right to science. So the book indeed also speaks of the importance of justiciability of the right to science, including at the international level. And there is, as is indicated, only one known case that Mikel also knows very well of the attempt to litigate the right to science at the international level particular the right to participate in scientific research before the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. But here also, I would like to stress that there's another body, the Human Rights Committee, that is ready to receive cases on the right to science. Because as the authors state in the book, several entitlements related to the right to science are canonical civil and political rights apply to the specific situation of scientists and the scientific enterprise. So they mention, for instance, academic freedom, which is certainly essential. But there are also other rights, such as freedom of expression, association, and movement. And I think they're crucial for the right to science, and they can perhaps facilitate these kind of cases. Now, I know the challenges to litigate at international level as regards the exhaustion of local remedies, the long time span for cases to be dealt with. But I also do think that the Human Rights Committee should receive more cases from academics who are arbitrarily arrested, fined, who lost their jobs, who, or who are not allowed to travel to participate, for instance, in conferences abroad. And what is Perhaps a bit of an advantage is that the optional protocol of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is ratified by 117 states. So they accept this individual communications procedure and it's states from all over the world. And that is compared to the optional protocol to the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is only ratified by 26 states. Now, another option could be the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which also has an individual communications procedure, for instance, for cases of gender discrimination in sciences. And the great advantage is perhaps also that many of the civil and political rights that I just mentioned, freedom of expression, freedom of association, are overall directly applicable in national legal orders unlike some economic, social, and cultural rights. And also the co covenant on civil and political rights does not have the framework of the progressive realization that the other covenant has. 
So especially issues of freedom of expression and non-discrimination can be well tackled in these cases. Now, as far as I know, the Human Rights Committee has not yet had cases of scientists or academic. The Human Rights, uh, the European Court of Human Rights has had several cases in this respect. And I hope that by awareness raising and advocacy, we can convince some lawyers, I'm sure Zidane is one of them, to bring such cases. Now, I know that many of us uh, consider the right to science mostly as a cultural right, and perhaps therefore it fits better with economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, I think this may be a very good point in our academic reflection that we do so often, but I'm not sure, looking from the committee's perspective, that victims of violation of the right to science, that they would actually care very much in which group or category this right falls. Sometimes lawyers and victims have to be creative in finding ways to hold states accountable for lack of respect or violation of human rights. And we see this also in the field of the environment, for instance, and the right to water and deep. Because the right to a clean and sustainable environment is recognized as a human right, but it's not included as such in an international human rights treaty. So we also have had now several cases on climate change and environmental degradation, which we dealt with under the right to private life and home, or eventually perhaps even under the right to life. And we also deal with cases as Human Rights Committee that perhaps fit officially better under the other covenant, such as on health issues under the right to life, or respect for private life, on housing under the right to private life and home. I just want to make the point that sometimes, but for instance, if the state in question is not a party to the optional protocol to the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, you have to be pragmatic, flexible, creative to perhaps find entry points in another covenant. And in my view, international human rights law is flexible or actually should be flexible in order to find a place for new topics or topics that perhaps are more explicit in another treaty. So finally, I warmly invite you therefore to bring issues related to the right to science to the attention also of the Human Rights Committee via shadow reports in the reporting procedure or via individual cases. The only criterion for us is that we can bring the issue or the case within our mandate, within this treaty, within the provisions of the covenant on civil and political rights. But for the right to science, in my view, that's actually not very difficult. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yvonne, also for this invitation to continue the work uh, within the UN system, even if the UN is now living a little bit of a crisis, I would say, in a variety of uh, offices, but perhaps the one that deals with human rights in Geneva is still up and running with all the also economic problems that they have. Thank you once again. The floor now goes to Hel Porstam, who's UNESCO Chair in Cultural Rights, Professor of History and Cultural Rights at University of Copenhagen. You have the floor, Hel, and welcome once again. Thank you very much. And I, I want to also congratulate the two authors on this very, very fine book. It's an excellent book, and I salute your work to actually uh, make the right to science justiciable and practicable so that it can be used in practice. I think that's very timely, as others have also said, just what we need. But I also, could I have the, the, the slide, please, uh, Eva, um, Laura? Will you help me with this, my slides? I have these, are they? Uh, L, you muted yourself. Not a good idea to do in the middle of a talk, I'm sorry. No, no. Um, can I have the second slide, please? The second one, thank you. Um, what I really, no, not that one, that one, yes. 
Um, I really greatly appreciate this wish to look at, no, it's the one, the previous one, it's the second uh, slide, please. Yes, not that one, the second one. <laughs> My apologies. Yes, there we go. That's the one. Thank you. Um, so I, I really appreciate your wish to look at and to describe the right to science as an enabling right. And to remind the right to science scholars that we shouldn't just focus or only focus on the prevention of negative effects or bad science, but also see science as something that is enabling and a positive right. And in this connection, you suggest, could I have the next slide, uh, that the time has come for states to affirm support of science, uh, scientists and the scientific endeavor in a binding legal instrument, the science treaty that, um, that has been mentioned a few times already. It would have such a science treaty, six essential commitments, these. It would recognize science as a global public good. It would secondly commit ratifying states to respect and articulate the core principles um, of scientific freedom and scientific responsibility. Thirdly, it would commit ratifying states to support both basic and applied research. And fourthly, it would address questions of anticipation and science diplomacy, set up new science policy interfaces. It would, fifth, the, the fifth commitment is that it would contain a pledge to push back against pseudoscience and scientific information, misinformation. And finally, in the sixth uh, commitment, it would commit states parties to keep science open and transparent. And here, I very much like the fact that you mentioned that copyrights and patents are not human rights. What Article 15.1 mentions in um, the, the, the last part um, is something else and that, that this needs to be explicitly recognized. I'm very grateful that you actually say this. Now, I wholeheartedly agree, like most of us, I guess, on the panel who have worked on this, um, with all these commitments and points and with the idea of having a science treaty. And it fits well also with um, the suggestion made by uh, the current UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, Alexandra Sansaki, their suggestion that she made in her report from February of this year on the right to participate in science, that we need a special rapporteur for No, you muted yourself again. Sorry. Must be a virus. So. I don't know what this is. Okay, yeah. sorry. That's okay. Well, in the fourth commitment of this proposed uh, science treaty, you mentioned science diplomacy and science policy interfaces. And this is something that I have been working on lately. Um, and that's why I've highlighted those concepts on this slide because I would like to suggest that science diplomacy in all its various facets uh, might be a topic for, uh, for future um, right to science scholars or for the right to science in the future. What interests me is science, science diplomacy in relation to Article 15.4, of course, um, that is as, as part of the, the right to science. This part of Article 15 that concerns um, states' obligations to recognize the benefits of international contacts and cooperation is, as you also say in your book, too often neglected. Science diplomacy is an umbrella term for the intersection of science and diplomacy, um, a way of creating stronger diplomatic relations through scientific uh, cooperation. There's nothing new about it. We have had that for a long, long time. Um, and in general, or most often, um, the, the, the kinds of relations or interactions between science and diplomats have involved national power interests, but not always. But science diplomacy as something of a more academic interest and subject to scholarly exploration, that's of a newer uh, date. That's more relatively new. And unlike traditional diplomacy, practitioners of science diplomacy uh, does, don't have to necessarily act as agents of the government or the state, but can be scientists or scientific advisors to diplomats. And can I have the next slide, please? One of these um, scientific advisors is Nina Fedorov. 
uh, who was science and technology advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State between 2007 and 10. And she offered this very brief uh, definition of what science diplomacy is. She, it is the use of scientific interactions among nations to address the common problems facing humanity and to build constructive knowledge-based international partnerships. Next slide, please. In 2009, the British Society, the, the British Royal Society, together with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, um, held a conference in London. And, and at this conference, um, they developed together a three-part taxonomy for what science diplomacy is or how it could be handled. And this is the kind of taxonomy that is most often referred to when you hear scholars talk about science diplomacy or when we engage with science diplomacy. There's science in diplomacy, which concerns advice that's based on science and that's given uh, with a view to promoting foreign policy objectives. We're talking about scientific briefings, reports for people in foreign ministries or other foreign policy actors, participation by scientists in national delegations to international meetings and so on. So here scientists merely help out. They're not the ones who set the agenda themselves. Then there is diplomacy for science. And it concerns how diplomats and international diplomacy can be helpful in promoting uh, scientific cooperation. A very simple form is the support that a country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs can provide for um, participation in conferences or, or for the publication of a book. Um, things that can help researchers reach a larger audience and that can promote interaction between researchers on an international level and thereby presumably also further the relationship between countries. Lastly, we have science for diplomacy, which concerns the use of scientific cooperation to improve international relations between countries. And here we're talking about scientific activities, which have a um, more systemic and changing effect on how states interact. And one good example is the European Organization for Nuclear Research, better known as CERN, which made it possible, for example, for scientists from Israel and Germany to meet after the Second World War um, and talk, and also made it possible to maintain scientific contact between Russia and the West uh, during the Cold War. Next slide, please. Um, the Royal Society and the AAAS taxonomy is sometimes represented like this with these three kinds of arrow, arrows between diplomacy and science. Um, and you will notice here that there's a fourth dimension missing, diplomacy in science. And over the past few years, together with good colleagues, I've been working on playing around with what such a possible fourth dimension of science diplomacy might be. It might have two parts. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Diplomacy in and diplomacy within science. In terms of diplomacy in science, we're talking about the external dialogue with the public, the, the, the scholar, between the scholarly, the scholarly world and that of the public and politicians. Uh, it concerns the kind of diplomacy that scholars have to engage in to increase the support of regional and national politicians. Most of all, of course, financial support, but also support that's going to strengthen uh, scientific and academic freedom, uh, the conditions under which scholars work, and the public trust in science as a whole. And when we talk about the public trust in science, we come to the second category that I've called diplomacy within science. Here, it, it, we're talking about the internal dialogue within the world of academia and research itself. Um, how do we, for example, promote in academia the ability of scholars to communicate, to engage with the public and with politicians? How do we create incentives within the world of, of scholarship or science for contributing to what a strong science policy interface? 
uh, codes of ethics for good research ethics fall into this category. And finally, there's interdisciplinary research. How do we conquer the mutual distrust that there often is between what has sometimes been called the two cultures? law, the humanities, social science, sciences on the one hand, and the natural health and technological sciences on the other. How do we promote the working together uh, with colleagues from all faculties across the university? And on that last point, slide, next slide, please. It's becoming clearer, says Peter Glockman, who is the current head of the ISC, the International Science Council, that we need to find new ways of doing science, such as employing transdisciplinary approaches. This itself is an internal form of diplomacy within science. Disciplinary silos need to be replaced by transdisciplinary approaches. The global and indeed national good needs the humanities, social sciences, data, health, and natural sciences and technologies to cooperate. Important values are at stake, futures are at stake, and science diplomacy of a new kind within ourselves will be needed too. So when science diplomacy is discussed in this way, it also covers or overlaps with the other three parts of Article 15. And it brings into view, the last slide, please, um, the human, the, the, how the human right to benefit from science and its applications catalyzes the advancement of human rights. This is how um, Volker Türk, the UN um, High Commissioner for Human Rights, put it in an article in Nature from uh, November 2nd, 2023. So I suggest that science diplomacy from all of these various perspectives could be a future right to science topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ella. Let me welcome also Andrea Borgia, who just joined us. The next speaker is Monica Plotza, Senior Research Associate and Lecturer at University of Luzern. Before giving the floor to her, I see there is um, some activities that are already taking place, uh, Q&A, and also in the chat. May I suggest that we keep comments in the chat and questions in the Q&A section so that once we are done with the, our speakers, Julia will read the the questions out loud and so we can see who can uh, who wants uh, to answer that. Monica uh, and Cesare and Andrea, we were a month ago in Geneva just to talk about the science diplomacy and, and trying to anticipate what could be the most interesting or uh, compelling things for the next 5, 10 to 25 years. I'm not sure if we actually understood what's going to happen in the next 5, 10 or 25 years, but uh, still, it was a very interesting forum uh, convened by Jesta at CERN. Uh, over a thousand people were there. You can find some of the speeches online. I suggest you follow bits and pieces of it because some of the issues that have been discussed there are being discussed now. And, and I think some of the contribution that may come out of today's meeting and the future work of Science for Democracy may also contribute to that type of discussions and exchanges. Monica, you have the floor. Grazie, Marco, and good evening, everyone from Switzerland. First, let me also congratulate you both, Cesare and Andrea, on your wonderful book, which adds much needed clarification also to the normative content and the scope of protection of the right to science. And thank you so much for having me in this webinar. So to also let me quote you from your final chapter of your book, you address justiciability and you say justiciability is still to be explored. And you also say that advocates should be entrepreneurial in finding and even engineering cases of colorable claims of violations of your right to science. And I was very much intrigued by this because this is also an aspect that I have been looking on in my PhD thesis, which I have just defended in May. So let me briefly share my screen with you. Okay, I don't find screen sharing in this view anymore. Ah, there it is, sorry. Okay, to, because I would like to focus on promoting the justiciability of the right to science in the future in international law. So first of all, 
what is actually justiciability and what do lawyers understand under the term of justiciability. So justiciability is the quality of a legal rule to be invoked before a judicial body and adjudicated upon. So basically, it means that an individual, when his or her right to science has been violated, that this person can go before a court or a UN treaty body to claim his or her right to science. And when we look more closely at the question of justiciability, it actually has two elements, a formal element and a material element. So formal justiciability refers to so-called adjudication mechanisms. So if there is a procedure in place that we could use a certain pathway and for the right to science, there is, of course, the optional protocol to the ISESCAR. But as Yvonne mentioned before, there are currently only 26 states that have ratified this optional protocol. And Yvonne also mentioned that it would also be a good idea to use the procedure under the ICCPR, so the other human rights covenant, which could also be a very good idea for the right to science. And next to formal justiciability, the second requirement is the so-called material justiciability, so the suitability of a human right for adjudication. And in our case with the right to science, this is, of course, Article 15 of the ICESCAR, but that it is actually materially justiciable, we need to have a sufficient enough understanding of the normative content, so of this scope of protection of the right to science. And this is usually done by legal interpretation or also by adjudication, so meaning by court cases. And this is the starting point of my presentation and of the next few minutes, because we do have formal mechanisms in place, so they are different procedures under the ISESCAR and ICCPR, but still uh, what still needs to be explored is actually the material justiciability, so in terms of justiciable content of the right to science. So when we look at the right to science, and as Cesare has uh, presented to us, in the beginning of this webinar, this wonderful puzzle of clusters of the right to science, you see here on this slide, the four different paragraphs of the right to science as they are stated in Article 15 of the ISESCAR. And now if we would like to find out which parts of these paragraphs are in fact justiciable, it becomes a bit more complicated because as Cesare has mentioned in the beginning, each of these paragraphs also then give rise to different sub rights. And then we have this huge cluster of different human rights of the right to science. This is why I, in my PhD thesis, I have focused on the core content of the right to science in order to render it justiciable. Because what is the core content of human rights in general? The core content of a human right is the part, the heart, the nucleus, without which a human right would lose its raison d'être. So it's really at the center of a human right, as you can see here on this visualization. And this core content requires immediate implementation, irrespective of a state's available resources, and if a state fails to fulfill the core content, this would also directly lead to a violation of the human right. And this is also interesting from a litigation perspective. This is very technical now, but um, it shifts the burden of proof and the burden of proof lies then with the state claiming that it couldn't fulfill its core obligation under human rights. But now returning to the right to science and the core content of the right to science, so what lies actually at the very heart of the right to science and is therefore already justiciable, is that usually when we look at the core content and at the normative content of human rights in general, we have on the one side rights, human rights, and they give rise to obligations by states, so to state obligations. And this is also the same with the core content. So the core content consists of core rights and these core rights, they give rise to core obligations. 
And this idea of core content and core rights is that they are actually derived from human dignity. But what human dignity is, is not defined in international human rights law. And also addressing this now, or also in my thesis, this would have opened a can of worms. So what I have done, and because we have this wonderful general comment number 25 by the UN Committee for Economic, so Social and Cultural Rights, which gives us a list with different core obligations of the right to science, it allowed me to do a so-called reverse engineering approach by deriving the core rights by the core obligation that were stated in this general comment, because it was important to me also to outline and reframe the discussion concerning the core content of the right to science towards those that it is intended to benefit, to frame it in the language of rights holders so they know what their core rights under the right to science actually are. And this led then again to interesting results because this again, this is the right to science with its four paragraphs. And in order to derive the core content, I of course looked at the core obligations, but I also looked at interconnected rights to the right to science because the right to science when you look at it in the entire system of human rights and the system is of course very interconnected interrelated and interdependent you see that the right to science can also overlap with other human rights and their core contents and there you might also have some overlapping core contents with the, which then also again add to the heart to the nucleus of the right to science so the result of this exercise then was, for instance, when we look at Article 15 1b, that we have different core rights under this uh, one paragraph, for instance, the right to scientific progress, protection from the adverse effects of science and its mimics, the right to mechanisms for policies and programs informed by scientific evidence, not based, but informed by scientific evidence, then there's also a right to scientific education, a right to scientific literacy, and a right to access scientific applications critical for the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights. Then when we look at a next substantive guarantee of the right to science, here, Article 15, Paragraph 3 of the ICESCAR, Core, the core content of this provision is the right to intellectual freedom, the freedom of scientific opinion and inquiry, the freedom of scientific expression, and of course, institutional freedom and autonomy, which are here at the core of this provision. And then there's also the right to equality and non-discrimination, which has a cross-cutting nature in the covenant, so it concerns all dimension of the right to science, to look at it also in this perspective of equality and non-discrimination, but particularly it's also about then non-discriminatory access to scientific progress and its applications and non-discriminatory participation in science. So this has been a um, very brief a tour d'horizon through the justiciable normative content and one uh, creative way of engineering for the future the justiciable, pa justiciable parts of the right to science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for sharing uh, this slides, very precise to some of the points that have been raised before. Uh, as said, this um, debate is going to be taped and we'll uh, post it on our website and on our YouTube channel, uh, Science for Democracy. Now, the floor goes to Andrea Borgio, last but not least. Andrea is a uh, um, professor of legal studies and fellow of, of the Center of Health and Behavioral Science of Bryant University and the co-author of the Human Right to Science. After Andrea's presentation, we will turn to questions and answers, please do not ask your questions in the chat, but do it in the section that's called Q&A. Andrea, you're on the floor. Thank you. Do you see me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much for uh, 
uh, not giving only giving me the floor, but I want to thank you the all the speakers who accepted to participate in today's webinar. Um, and I apologize for not being <clears throat> present earlier. I'll rewatch or I'll watch later the the comments. I can't really have a space for rejoining here because uh, I only got the last two talks. Uh, um, uh, but again, thanks for being here, and, um, and it's a little celebration of our accomplishment, and it's good to to see uh, familiar faces. Um, so, um, uh, um, I have a few things I want to say, no slides. Uh, I want to say a couple of things about the book, and then uh, 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 two or three things about sort of the future of the right to science. Uh, um, a couple of things about the book. Uh, uh, I don't know how much uh, Chesa has uh, shared uh, about this, uh, the work, but certainly it was a, a long and painful process uh, um, and with some sweet and tears uh, along the way and the fact that it was uh, the f two of us uh, uh, help uh, the process. So typically, uh, the crime was on one side and not the other. Uh, and so I want to also thank Cesare for having been uh, a loyal uh, partner in this project. Uh, uh, one of the key aspects of, uh, we started uh, uh, before, uh, not only the pandemic, but also the adoption of General Comment 25, which is really a sort of a central instrument uh, in regard to uh, where we are now with the right to science. Uh, and um, um, and so uh, that was really a changing moment, and we it really extended a bit to the uh, the process of writing the book. We, we needed to read it, incorporate it, and think about it. Um, we sort of uh, uh, I want to make a point about the methodology. We sort of uh, uh, since we had it so fresh, we used the general comment twenty five as a sort of a starting point or at least a firm point. Uh, for grounding the analysis of this normative content. Um, and so we didn't really challenge uh, its content, uh, um, but we took it for as a source of authority, which is in itself uh, maybe it's problematic, but I think it's important to explicitly acknowledge that that was a choice we made uh, uh, and we, we, we stand by that choice, but it's also a choice of not uh, uh, considering controversial some of its um, aspects. Uh, and, and I think Monica did, for what I understand, something similar in accepting uh, some of the, the core content of that uh, right to be as they were articulated there. Um, particularly, I think the core content is really the area where uh, we really uh, respected uh, the content of general comment. Uh, the second point about the book that we also had certain ambitions in, in writing it, uh, and particularly with its size and scope, uh, we didn't accomplish everything we wanted to accomplish. We, there were parts we have to leave out at some point just because we couldn't uh, go on forever. Um, but uh, it, it was, I think the ambition uh, was in part to uh, have a, a comprehensive view of what the uh, normative content on the right is, uh, uh, with the ambition of catalyzing uh, scholarly interest and interest from practitioners. Uh, not necessarily to have the right answer, but at least to have the right questions about the right and to define the scope of where it can be placed, uh, both in the, inter in the human rights uh, um, discourse, but also in the science and technology policy discourse. Uh, so I think it's important also to acknowledge the ambition of that. Uh, as uh, we, uh, as I think about the, the future of the right to science, uh, so we write uh, certain things in our uh, final chapter about what to do with the right concerning justiciability, uh, enforcement, uh, possibly a science treaty. Uh, I want to focus on three other things that probably are not particularly well articulated in, in the chapter, um, and some speak to the audience that is here today, um, and some maybe um, uh, they, are, they are more general. Um, so I think number one, uh, it's... Um, uh, my invitation is to keep consolidating this uh, uh, collective understanding of the normative content of the sciences, rights and obligations, and who are the actors and how they relate to uh, this, uh, this interesting provision. Um, and the goal is in part to align the terminology so that we all use the same sort of terminology uh, and to uh, also uh, maybe under, uh, emphasize the commonalities of the analysis as opposed to the differences. I think internally we should keep debating and, 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 and maybe disagreeing 
on certain issue. But at least externally, uh, it's a critical moment to uh, create a, some conceptual unity about what the right is. I mean, we propose a, a, a sort of um, framework. It doesn't have to be the definite one. Um, and uh, we're sort of willing to, to change aspects of that. Uh, um, there's no rigidity in that project, but it's important to uh, face that process, I think. Uh, I was reading recently uh, the Health and Human Rights uh, Journal um, publishing out of Harvard uh, early this summer at a celebrating issue or celebrative issue of the health and rights movement. And one of the articles uh, by um, Sofia Guskin, the opening article is June 24, volume 26, uh, reflects on the health and human rights uh, uh, movement. And I think there's a lot to be learned for the science and human rights movement. Uh, and so the first step was really to create this uh, sort of a commonly shared uh, conceptual framework. And the second step they took, uh, and I think that's also something that uh, is worth emphasizing and maybe putting as an item for, for our agenda, is to develop training training material in syllabi. I know there is something out there, um, but there are not many programs on science and human rights and science diplomacy. Uh, and so it would be a good thing, I think, to uh, maybe think about uh, what uh, a core uh, syllabus, maybe for different levels uh, on science and human rights will look like uh, and some of the basic readings uh, and some of the basic points and, and learning outcomes. Uh, it's, uh, I think it uh, will be training uh, for human rights, uh, for lawyers, but also for scientists and also for other actors uh, in the sort of the science and technology ecosystem. And I think the first uh, point I want to make, uh, it's really about creating uh, bridges uh, with uh, uh, other disciplines or um, uh, professional uh, environments uh, that populate this ecosystem. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular of two. One is the ethics of science and technology, uh, which has its own principles and terminology and um, tradition. Uh, and the second one is the science and technology policy or governance uh, world where there is also uh, their own, they have their own concepts uh, and models and, and terminology. Uh, and I think it's very important to uh, create certain bridges to start communicating the value uh, of the different approaches and how can be integrated. Uh, I say that in a day in which one of my writings came out where I actually argue for uh, sort of moving away from the ethics, the, the global ethics in technology and science and uh, adopting more of a human rights approach, um, uh, maybe a humanist governance, I call it. But uh, but I think it's important uh, for these bridges to be created now that we have, a, 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 I think, a critical uh, mass of individuals, uh, but also concepts that are coming to emerge and coming to surface and being consolidated. Uh, so I, I'm going to stop here and uh, I'd be interested in see where the discussion goes and maybe some of the speakers have more um, questions or comments for each other. I'm not going to steal Marco's job, but um, I'm done for now. No stealing because it's going to be Julia's job. Okay. So as I said, um, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom page. Uh, we already have some questions. Some people could not poll, paste the question in the section, but I see that Julia has already taken note of. I would suggest that Julia reads it out, and then whoever has uh, or wants to take it, uh, give it a shot, can uh, turn on their camera and uh, reply. And if there are two or more people that would like to do so, then we can have the discussion that also Andrea was hoping for. Julia, please. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. So I'll start with a question from Sylvia, um, the question is, how could one mobilize learned societies to protect the human rights of scholars and students? Uh, may I propose that we all turn on the cameras and uh, and uh, we so that we are all engaged. And I mean, like, first of all, I think it's Yvonne that's more points in your direction, right? Yes, please. Can you can, can you? I was think afraid that? you were going to say that, but <laughs> no, I know. pleasure. This is your name all um, over it. I think there's still a lot of um, awareness raising to do and capacity building as well at the same time. And of course, books such as this one help, but also perhaps uh, 
very accessible information to civil society organizations, uh, others that work with human rights, because again, very often science, academia, it's not so much considered by many as a human rights issue in the first place. Education, yes, but science and those kind of things, not many people will immediately see that as an issue of human rights. And we've experienced, all of us, I guess, have experienced that when we go out of our bubble uh, of human rights lawyers, of human rights and social and political scientists, and go out in the field of so-called the, the hard sciences and, and try to convince people there that what they do has something to do with human rights as well. And not only them as scientists, but also what they do, their purpose, their dissemination of their information and knowledge. So uh, there's still a lot of work to do in that area, I guess, in terms of making people aware that the right to science exists. And then the second part of it is, of course, what does it entail? Now, again, we've come a long way. I think we have also from today's webinar, you can see that the contours of this right are actually well, clear to a large extent. Um, and now it's a matter of, uh, well, making it, as we used to say amongst ourselves, actionable, justiciable by having cases, but also by having people in policy making, making them aware that this is an issue. So it goes into the heart of science council, science uh, policy, all these kind of things where the human rights lens is not often part of the discussions when we draft, for instance, science policies. So there's a lot to do. And again, there's not that many human rights organizations that actually do this. So these seminars, but also the dissemination of all of this information, I think is crucial to make some pro progress. But as already was said by several uh, speakers this evening, it's also to reach out beyond the legal, social science, political science field, and to reach out to also other far parts of, uh, of science. Thanks. I'll let Hella continue. All right. Um, I think it's happening already. I mean, I've worked with the Danish Royal Society for Science and the Norwegian one, and I know that there's a trans-European um, organization for these learned societies that work on precisely these issues. So I think it's happening and it's an, it's an obvious place to talk about these issues, these learned societies. And the, the, the kind of thing I did together with the Danish Royal Society also involved uh, scholars at risk. I represent my country in, in the European part of, of scholars at risk. So that was quite natural that, that they were a part of this too. So I really think much of this is happening already and that there is a, a very strong interest in issues concerning academic freedom, scientific freedom uh, in those uh, societies. So it's ongoing already. Thank you, Hella. Michael? Yes, I, I agree with the idea that uh, sometimes in the beginning it's hard for scientists to 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 understand their work on uh, or with a human rights uh, focus. Uh, but uh, at the very same time, in my humble experience, it's also true that uh, once they they see and they under, they understand the, the idea. Scientists and the, 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 the uh, scientists, uh, science organizations are um, extremely uh, open and welcoming to the idea of the human right to, to science, not only as a, a tool to protect their work, but uh, also as a tool to understand the responsibility of their work. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, we'll move on to another question. Uh, we have in the Q&A from Wanda Wilson from Right to Science in Ethiopia. I'm wondering how much of indigenous forms of sciences can be characterized as science in the way we are using it here. Um, they're part of the Science Policy Panel on Chemicals and Waste, which is currently under negotiation under the auspices of UN Environment Program. And this is exactly one of the questions in contention. Previously, what was recognized as science as, sorry, uh, previously what was recognized as science is the one from recognized research institutions by recognized 
groups of people known as scientists in peer reviewed formats and often by people belonging to epistemic communities. This seems to have relegated certain forms of knowledge from science and hence restricting participation in the making of it as these people are not often recognized as scientists. And this is in the q and I think everyone should be able to see it if you want to have it in front of you. Maybe I can start by attempting to answer this question. So when it comes to indigenous knowledge and science, so the scope of protection of the right to science, and as I understand it, and maybe this is one point that Andrea mentioned that we should get some external agreement onto the outside. So what falls under the scope of protection is that I see when we look at the wording science, in also particularly the English language is very narrow. So on first glance, you would only see natural science as being part of the scope of protection of the right to science. But if you look at it more holistically, and if you adopt a human rights understanding and look at it more closely, it involves more knowledge systems. So not only academic disciplines, which then also includes social sciences and the humanities, but you can also move beyond academic knowledge systems, which then could also include indigenous and traditional science, but then you need also to distinguish which kind of knowledge that falls then under the scope of protection of the right to science. And if you could say that the methodologies with which this knowledge is acquired, for instance, knowledge that has been passed down for generation and then form some sort of um, epistemology that could be viewed as a scientific method, so to say, broadly speaking, it could very well fall under the scope of protection of the right to science. But this is a first attempt from my side, and I would be very curious to hear what others think about this issue. Ms. Lisa, Andrea, go ahead. You are muted. Yeah, uh, Mikael was before me, if you want to. So sorry, Mikael, please. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, of course, this is was, was uh, this was uh, one of the 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 the, the, the question we discussed when uh, discussing the the the, the, the drafts of uh, the general comet. And of course, uh, in relation to to uh, uh, to the human rights to science, science is much more than a professional activity based on on peers and based on a professional uh, the the institution. It's a much more complex uh, human uh, and, uh, challenge endeavor, uh, uh, and uh, an approach to 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 science is is right in the in the um, in the text of the general comment, and uh, I invite uh, you to 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 consider a uh, paragraph four. And five of uh, the general comment, the general comment saying that uh, science encompasses natural and social sciences, uh, it refers both to the process and to the results, uh, and uh, that uh, science is um, any uh, activity that is open to the stability, falsibility, uh, etc. Et you have this uh, this uh, approach. Uh, it is not, a, of course, a definition of science, but an approach to science in order to understand uh, it uh, in the framework of the human right to science. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to add a couple of things. I think uh, one other reading will be the 2024 uh, report by the Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, uh, uh, who addresses this issue of uh, <clears throat> boundaries of science and forms of knowledge that are uh, maybe not considered to be traditionally part of science. Uh, so there, there is, a, I think, a, a dynamic concept here we're working with. Um, but I also want to highlight the fact that the uh, participatory element of the right, the right to participate in scientific progress, uh, in part uh, uh, alleviates some of these problems because it entitles everyone to be part of the process of making science and uh, making science policy. So in that case, the negotiation of a treaty must be 
uh, you know, participatory and in, in, include uh, perspectives of knowledge or epistemic perspective that may not be scientific, but maybe indigenous or other views. Uh, um, also, the concept of uh, participation in science uh, includes uh, citizen science or views that are not formally trained sci scientists that can also be uh, participating in the production of scientific knowledge. So there are different ways to uh, to bring in, I think, uh, different um, knowledge that comes from from different premises or me methodologies. Uh, for uh, you know, for once in the book, uh, uh, we took a little bit more conservative approach uh, based on the general comment in the UNESCO that is quoted there uh, of um, more of a line of a, a traditional traditional sense of science in a, with a certain formalized methodology. Um, it seems like the conversation has progressed from from there, from when uh, when we originally ideated that chapter, and that may be something that's going to change in the future. But uh, I think even if we have a more conservative view of what science is, there's still many other um, avenues to bring in different forms of knowledge within uh, the science policy or the uh, or the science diplomacy uh, arena. I think. But uh, it's not that important, I think, that question. On the other end, I think uh, my question is always uh, to, uh, if there is a, a distinction made in, in Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the other in, in instruments about science and other forms of culture, well, I think it's relevant and needs to be maintained and explored. But there is a reason why I think science was singled out as one specific form of uh, cultural production. And, and I think it's valuable as such. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Michael and Monica as well. Oh yes, Hella, please go ahead. If I may, is that okay to, to, to this question, which is such a, an important one? Uh, I think basically the, the world is in such a mess in so many different ways that we need all the knowledge we can get. So it's, uh, you know, it's, we need traditional knowledge, we need um, old fashioned science, we need all of it to get us moving uh, in, into to, to try to solve some of these problems. And Andrea, you mentioned citizen science, and, and I sometimes uh, think of um, an event that I attended, this was in Denmark, and a, a person on a panel was telling us that there was a, a physicist at, at another Danish university who could not solve a particular problem. And then this problem was, was uh, you know, laid out into the social media, and a taxi driver from, from a nearby city solved that problem. So I'm just trying to say that we really need all, all the knowledge we can, we can get. Thank you, Hella. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. This one is from Giza. Um, they'd like to hear more analysis and examples of the state's obligation to conserve. Treatment Action Group is exploring this in the context of infectious diseases, tuberculosis, and antimicrobial resistance, but would appreciate to hear others' perspectives. Hello, you're muted. In, in what sense can can you? Uh, I, I'm not sure I quite understand the the question. What what is it? The uh, can can you maybe read it again or ask the uh, the person who asked it to uh, elaborate a bit? Yes, um, I think they want to hear more analysis and examples of the state's obligation to conserve, presumably within the right to science, and they say that. There's groups that are already exploring this, but they want to hear your perspectives. If the um, person asked this question, Giza or Giza, uh, would like to elaborate. Yes, there we go. Um, they said there are three main obligations, develop, diffuse, and conserve. But the conserve obligation seems less, less explored. Is anyone working on that? If I can answer that, I'm not aware of anyone specifically works on that. 
Um, but I'm taking assiduously notes because we're going to have a second edition of the book <laughs> if I manage to convince Andrea to go back <laughs> at some point in the near future and start working on it. And there are so many other things that we have not addressed that we need to address. And it is definitely as I was already taking notes and it's uh, something that we should do. Yeah, if I can say a couple of things, uh, um, maybe yeah, at least in our analysis, we sort of gave it for granted uh, because uh, it's such a basic obligation <laughs> that uh, I think uh, science needs to be recorded. And in part uh, because of the system, the traditional system of peer review and publication, there is um, the conservation has happened through uh, publication journals, books, libraries. So we touch a little bit upon that. Uh, um, if anything, we have an excess of information. Um, certainly, uh, I've seen uh, one interesting aspect, for instance, that I've seen recently is the challenge to the uh, internet um, uh, archives, right? Uh, I forget exactly the name of the, the website, but in the United States, uh, there are issues of uh, uh, copyright issues, challenges to uh, maintain the archive of the internet, uh, which will be a loss uh, for cultural heritage, but also for science, of course, and also not only for the scientific documents uh, recorded there, but also as a as a source of information for historians and scientists uh, doing research on the past. And so uh, it certainly is an issue. I don't think we, we, I think there are issues that are more pressing and we focus more on, but that's certainly uh, something worth uh, the time and effort. I think Hella was next. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm I'm working. I'm very interested in. And you, Andrea, mentioned the world of cultural heritage. Um, if you take it quite literally, there's conservation going on. Uh, old paintings, for example, in in the world of museums. Um, where um, it, it's, it's to me, it's so intriguing being interested as I that was part of my talk, my interest in, in interdisciplinarity. I really think we need to work together across the two cultures. This is literally what they do in that world of museums. These are chemists working on how to preserve, conserve um, old paintings, for example, um, as, as cultural objects. So I, I think exactly the cultural heritage arena is, is one arena where this kind of thing is happening at a very literal level. Thank you, Cesare, if you have more to add. Well, no, I don't have more to add on this question. I was uh, suggesting to jump to another question that caught my eyes. It's from someone who says that uh, lamenting the state of science in Argentina these days, you know, with uh, government cuts and salaries, inflation, demonizing and attacking scientists and not answering requests by scientists and all of that. And the person says, I would like to see a more active engagement of the international community was happening in that country at this very moment. So to that, my reply is, please, let's talk, because one, Argentina is one of the 27 states that have ratified the optional protocol to the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, accepting the possibility of individual complaints. I would love to make a case against Argentina, but, and here is the catch. The problem is that in order to bring this case before a human rights body, which, by the way, could also be Yvonne's business, because we could also frame some of those things in terms of violation of the covenant of similar political rights. All right, regardless of which treaty we go, we need to have exhausted domestic remedies. And that is the biggest problem when it comes to international litigation. This is the biggest obstacle. We need to find some people who have fought that battle domestically and have gone through the whole system and the advantage that I have on the covenant of civil and political rights is that there's no time limit. It has to be within a reasonable time, but there's no strict time limit. Covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, we have one year to bring a communication. Right now, I'm working double speed with Andrea because we are working on one that and Marco to hopefully to file against Italy by November 19th, right? But because we have a deadline. But finding the right case 
where the persons have framed the, the problem in the right terms, brought it before domestic courts, exhausted all levels of jurisdiction, and the case is not too old and it's still, still ripe to bring it before international jurisdiction is literally like finding a diamond in a mine. But here is the great thing. If we outsource the searching of those diamonds, is there's more people out there who look for them, then it's going to be easier to find them. And then we can put them in the system and then eventually lead to a mobilization through judicialization. Yes, thank you, Ivan. Yes, wonderful, uh, and indeed a very good idea. And sometimes actually the whole mobilization at national level may already make quite a difference uh, in a region also, because let us also not forget, I mean, we're talking now much about the UN system, but of course there's also a regional human rights bodies that, uh, that could be interesting to look at. Um, what I was also referring to, and this is perhaps for some others who are working on particular countries, check when your country or that country that you're working on is indeed up for a dialogue with one of the treaty bodies. And it can be the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, it can be the Human Rights Committee, or as I said, it can be the Committee on uh, Elimination of Discrimination Against Women if there's particular gender aspects to the right to science that you would like to raise, because then at a very early stage, you can become involved in perhaps putting this on the agenda or in UN jargon, it's the list of issues, the issues that we want to discuss with the state in those reporting dialogues. And so you can see from the calendars usually where a certain state is. So if Argentina is somehow soon on either, either our calendar or the other one, it's really time to, uh, to intervene perhaps uh, now and then to see if you could put information on this particular issue on the agenda. And also I would like to mention in this regard where also some of us are working on is to use other mechanisms such as the Universal Periodic Review, which is another reporting procedure, but then under the Human Rights Council. It's different, it's Human Rights Council, a state's representative, so it's a different body in the United Nations system. But still, you know, if you want to get more states also mobilized, or at least be aware of this, then we should perhaps put, you know, many, many different places where we try to enter into this system. And, and many of the, the viewers today can perhaps try to do that from the perspective of their own. One of the challenges I would just generally like to mention, which has not become not been so much often remembered or mentioned this evening, is of course the whole role of non-state actors which remains a challenge, I think, for many of us because international human rights law is drafted for states mostly. And however, at the same time, science, research, technology is very much in the hands of non-state actors, big multinational corporations, of course. Um, and yeah, there's also a whole lot to discuss on that particular aspect and how states should deal with that because a lot of the knowledge that we need, a lot of the knowledge that we want to share a lot of the knowledge and, and techno technology and, and things that we would like to conserve and diffuse is actually not so easy in the hands of states, but much more in the hands of companies who are not so eager always to share those. Just to not to discuss this perhaps in detail, this whole topic, but it is something we need to keep in mind. Thank you. Now, if I might add to what, what this one was saying in the, in the dialogue, um, in the chat uh, box, I put the link that leads you to the calendar where you can see what countries are coming up for review under which system. So that will give you guidance. It's a bit difficult system to navigate, but you know, eventually everyone can figure out things. Um, as Science for Democracy, we have been engaged in doing parallel reports for many years. Um, I can say that for right now, I'm working with my students at Loyola Law School on preparing a parallel report on Germany that is coming up for review under the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. We pick Germany because it's a very advanced and developed country, and it's one where scientific issues can become very salient and prominent in public debate. Um, so for instance, in that case, we're focusing on restrictions on research on human embryos. Uh, but we also are doing work on, for instance, in Burkina Faso right now on question of access to reproductive 
uh, health, which is a core human right, but there's of course one human right where the right to science applies in rights of women and in the reproductive field. So of course, if you start declining or applying the right to science to a lot of fields of knowledge, the number of possibilities of engagement with the system is basically infinite. The only thing that is short of is two, one, ideas, and second, time. But we are many and we will be able to crowdsourcing to overcome all those problems. Thank you, Cesare. Marco, you something yeah. to add? Yes, and just a piece of information. We'll send out an email after this webinar a link to the page where all the shared reports that have been mentioned have been published and discussed in the past, and also to uh, to, uh, to reply to what Yvonne just suggested. Uh, because we know Italy more better than other countries, we just submitted a 20-page uh, list of issues uh, to the UPR because Italy is going to be up for uh, review next year. And we actually, unfortunately, have to send a letter to the permanent members of uh, to the, the in Geneva because uh, Italy just adopted another law uh, a, a month ago concerning surrogacy. So uh, it's unfortunately an ongoing process, even if the document has been sent in July by the deadline. We are updating missions now to ask questions on specific and, and later issues. So, and we will add that link also to the email just to give you an example of how things should be done. If you don't have either the time or the expertise, we can try and find uh, a way to collaborate. Also, I think perhaps Julia, you can put a link uh, once again in the chat. That we are we're happy to have interns at uh, Science for Democracy or people that would like to volunteer their their time to help us doing things, and then we can have a chat with you if you're interested in doing that in the next uh, few weeks, so that we can not only expand the organization but also the work we do. Yes, thank you. And I'll share all the links once again uh, into the chat box. In the meantime, we have another question from Valeria. Uh, and this one is more directed towards, I believe it, she said Professor Horsdam. Um, How can we put in place a true transdisciplinary approach if scholarly careers are strictly constrained by a single discipline, for example, as concerns publications and competitions? That's an excellent question and a very hard one to answer, of course. Um, back in the 1950s, when there was the old two cultures debate, um, what was his name, the guy, and it always escapes me, who actually brought up this issue. The problem was he said that presently in the 1950s, the problem was that the humanities were so strong in Great Britain that the sciences were, the natural sciences were suffering. And today, of course, it's exactly the other way around. So I'm, I'm of the opinion, which is something that many of my colleagues would, in the humanities would hate me for, that we have to tack on to the science, the natural sciences, that's where the, and, social, and the, the health sciences, that's where the money is. And if we can somehow work with that, but in such a way that we end up doing anyhow what, what it is we would like to do, I think that's the future for us so that we don't end up in the humanities. The social sciences and law is, is different, I think. But the humanities right now are extremely defensive uh, and sometimes just too defensive, uh, unwilling to, to talk to anybody else but, but their own kind of saying, we are good enough in the humanities. Yes, of course we are, but it doesn't hurt to work with others. And so that issue, I think, will come up more and more. The need for transdisciplinary work will come will come up more and more. And, and I think it's something that most of us will have to deal with one way or another. How do we actually work together with the other camp, as it were? I don't know whether that actually answers the question, but... <laughs> yes, that was great. Thank you, Hella. Okay, so we only have 10 more minutes, but we'll try to answer uh, as many more questions as we can, just to try and get through these. So um, we have a question from um, the newly organized Right to Science organization in Ethiopia, and they'd like to know, um, could the speakers reflect on the need to build a global movement or coalition for the right to science through building partnerships with relevant civil society 
organizations in developing countries, such as their newly organized group? That's a question for Marco. He's very good at, at doing that. All right, actually, uh, exactly five years ago with Andrea, we were in Addis Abeba with the University of Turin to have a seminar on the right to science. So yes, it's possible, unfortunately. And then we were there again in February 2020 at the Commission of the African Union to discuss not only with people, um, everyday citizens in the academia, but also with member states of the African Union, the issues related to the right to science. Um, because it may take a little time, why don't we set up a, a call in, during the week or maybe the week after that to try and understand. We are now raising funds to go back to travel the world, so maybe 2025, which is a jubilee year, so miracles may happen. Um, we may have enough resources to, to go back to Africa where we actually wanted to have something in 2021, but because we were all blocked at home, we couldn't go. But certainly, it's a good idea. On the web page of Science for Democracy, you find an appeal that we drafted with Giza Deng, that I also asked questions before, to try and and understand what could be common a common ground to promote a coalition for the right to science along the lines of many other coalitions that have been. Uh, 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 active in the past, the Cesar and I met 30 years ago in New York, where there was in the newborn coalition for the International Criminal Court. So things can only not only bring together people, but also achieve objectives. So why not? Perfect. Thank you, Marco. All right. Let's see another one. Um, so data asks, does realization of the right to science not require people to recognize sound science and evidence? So any resolution and statement need to include a right to good information and evidence know-how. Is that a question or a comment? Um... It is worded as a question. Okay. I don't know. I think this person might have actually needed to leave early, so I don't know if they're still here to clarify. Um, well, it is maybe Mikael. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps in order to add uh, some uh, references, not to answer a question, but to add uh, some uh, additional views to this uh, the question. I can recall again to, to the, the wording of the, uh, of the general comment, which in uh, relation to to court uh, obligation by the, the states refers in a very uh, direct uh, manner some uh, ideas. No? For, for example, the obligation uh, for the state to promote uh, accurate scientific information, refrain from disinformation, uh, uh, adopt a mechanism to protect, to protect people from the harmful consequences of uh, false or pseudoscience-based practices, uh, especially when uh, other economic, social, and cultural rights are at risk. So just are additional examples of this kind of uh, approaches. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikael. No, Andreas, do you want to add anything? No, no, I, I want to reiterate that that's a core obligation <clears throat> according to general comment. So the answer, I guess, picking up on LA, it is a statement, but <laughs> that's uh, a right to have that information uh, in not only accessed, but also implemented in the policies. Yeah, thank you very much. I think one uh, one other source uh, could be to look also at the uh, special rapporteurs on uh, toxic substances um, report from uh, two or three years ago that really elaborates this in that context, but certainly is a general application applicability. Sorry, so it can be uh, it's a good analysis that can be read and applied in other environments. Thank you. Um, so there's We'll keep going. Uh, if the our panelists are able to stay for maybe another 10 minutes, then we should be able to answer all of our questions. Um, if anyone needs to leave, then of course they can hop off 
when they have to. But if the majority of the group can stay a little bit longer, I think that would be great for, for the people here. Okay, great. Then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, they say, it's interesting to note that transdisciplinary, tra sorry, transdisciplinarity is taking center stage to bridge, to better bridge between science and policy. Do we have examples that are successful in facilitating transdisciplinary interactions resulting in uncontested science that is taken up by policy, either global or national? Do you see a role for learning slash research institutions to think transdisciplinarily? At the moment, this seems to be a space characterized by siloed disciplines. I don't know if I, I can start since I was the one who brought up this this need for interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity, whatever we want to call it. I think it's 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 it precisely those silos that are the problem. And sometimes I also think that um, we in the humanities and the social sciences are extremely critical of each other. When we review or assess um, a, a funding application, for example, we tear each other down and we are famous for, my, my colleagues in the history department always say that what history is all about is being critical. And yes, that is so true. But when you see how some of those applications are being assessed in the natural sciences, they are much more um, open. They're much more, this is a fantastic project. Um, there might be this or that question that might come up, but by and large, they are much better at and therefore in getting, getting research money. So I think we have to copy that just a little bit without losing, of course, that which we can do. And it's also typical, I think, right now that there are many in the sciences, for example, in the, the food sciences um, that I have talked to that say, well, we have the science pretty much. We know what is, what is, what is good for people to eat, but we can make people comply. So how on earth do we make people comply? How do we show people that this, this is actually evidence-based and this is what they ought to do? So... Um, we need to talk much more than we do, I think, across um, the, the disciplines. Thank you very much. Yvonne, with that? Yeah, exactly. Following on that, because there was other, also another question. It's more about also the link between science and policy making. And of course, one of the parts of the right to science, uh, which is a bit more of a newer part of it, is how it informs policy making or how it should inform policy making but that of course goes both ways right that it means that science should serve to a certain extent or be at least relevant for policy making but that also politicians policy makers trust science base themselves at least to a large extent on scientific evidence and these kind of things and there as Ella gave the example indeed there is much more needed also in terms of scientists getting together in terms of you know, having the factual knowledge on certain treatment, for instance, also in health or on certain food issues, water issues, all kinds of things. But where the social sciences and legal, the law sciences are needed to say, okay, but why would people indeed comply with that? How would they see it as an important thing? How can we fight uh, disinformation? Um, all these kind of issues demand indeed that transdisciplinarity -dis on the other hand, I think we all know that it's not always easy, right? We don't always speak the same language. We don't use the same concepts. Even if we talk about rights and obligations, that may mean something different in law than it may mean in ethics, that it may mean in other disciplines. So it's sometimes also a bit harder. We have to work a bit harder and do our best to find each other somewhere. And then the link with policymaking remains a big challenge because we need to have scientific evidence, rigor, all the scientific issues that are in place to do good science. But at the same time, you need to make it at some point available and accessible to also policymakers, how they should translate that into policies. And that requires another form of communication, another form of getting your message to certain audiences. Uh, and this is a major challenge, I think, for all of us. But uh, again, it requires also a bit of both ways, that also politicians, policymakers are able, willing to engage with scientists and engage with people in the sciences to listen to them and to see what they have to offer. Thanks. Thank you. 
it may interject, I have to excuse myself because I have to go and work with those um, students who are doing all those beautiful advocacy and litigation projects on the right to science. Uh, but I wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today. And of course, <laughs> see you soon in many other places, many other forums. The battle is long it's, and we will continue, definitely. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Cesare. Okay, so we'll try to wrap up quickly. Um, we have another question, Giza. If we're looking at the right to health as a comparative development, we need to pay attention that the right to health was largely driven by activists and advocates of communities affected by specific diseases. There is now a movement to integrate the right to science as part of the tools for health and human rights issues. What spaces does academia, for example, have to collaborate with activists and NGOs? This in itself would be an embodiment of the participatory aspect of the right to science. Well, I can say a couple of things, but um, <clears throat> certainly there is um, a space. Uh, um, maybe the legal clinics is one of them, uh, like the one uh, uh, where Chisa works, uh, uh, labs of universities. Uh, policy labs uh, uh, would be another one. Uh, I think these uh, partnership needs to be created with universities. Uh, not every university would be interested. I think part of my uh, call earlier to think about also training and syllabi and things like that, uh, these programs need to be created. And this attention within these inst academic institutions to mm, pay attention to these problems. The funding may be there, as Ellis uh, suggested, tagged with uh, uh, core scientific uh, programs. Uh, uh, so need, these things need to be forged and created, but um, there is some space, I think. Thank you. Okay. I think we only have two more, perfect, yes. Okay, so the next one is, what can be done when democracy leads to the election of politicians who are against science and scientists? I think we spoke on this a little bit already, if anyone wants to speak a bit more on the subject. Yes, please, Marco. Well, that could take another couple of hours. So my brief answer would be, let's see what they do and then challenge them in courts. Because ideologically, you don't want to fight ideology with a counter ideology. You have to judge people for their actions. If it's a democracy, you will have the mechanisms to try and bring them to before the law in case they violate rights, the rule of law, all the other things that we have uh, discussed today, including the right to science. There we go. Hello? Yeah. I just, sorry. There we go. I just, I just wanted to say also to come back a little bit to the previous question about activism. I think um, it is, of course, you know, th th that whole question of academics and scholars participating uh, outside of their, their expertise or with the rest of society is a big question also when it comes to the trust in scholarship. Um, there has to be a very fine balance, I think, between being an activist and still being considered um, uh, an, an expert who is trying to deal in evidence-based uh, policymaking. That's a very, very fine balance. And if we go beyond that and become too activist, I'm also afraid that people will say, well, that's just his or her opinion. That has nothing to do with science. Why should I trust that person? So these issues, I think, go together and they have to do with also how do we preserve, how do we create more trust for science? One way is to, be, to try to be objective, neutral, and to only talk about that on which we have expertise. But then what about activism, as was asked about before? So that's a big issue for, you know, as far as I can tell. Thank you very much. Okay, and I think this will be our final question. What is the direction regarding the subsequent actions in terms of inclusiveness of this movement, including in Africa and others? Marco? Well, I think what Ella has just said uh, may be part of the answer, or rather uh, a suggestion for future activities. 
So may I suggest to the people that are now following from Africa or Latin America that have also posed questions to email uh, to info at scienceforddemocracy.org uh, a specific suggestion, but also trying at the same time to reach out to colleagues in the regions to let them know that perhaps we could have a strategy meeting, let's say at the beginning of next year to try and go back either with, to, well, certainly to do what uh, Cesare suggested. That is to go through the list of countries that may be before the various UN bodies in the future to talk about human rights so that together or independently, we can come up with the shadow reports and submit them to try and raise some of the issues that have been um, included in the question today. Now, on the side of civil society organizations or academia, we can have this meeting in a couple of months, let's say, and see how what we can do now. For the time being, we can meet online. If one day we may go, want to go back either to Mexico or to the Philippines, why not? Uh, we have participated in several discussions, ongoing discussion, perhaps, for instance, of the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee that uh, is discussing another couple of general comments. One of them is very critical because it has to deal with the international drug control system and the impact that they have on economic, social, and cultural rights, and we have participated from a distance, uh, or we can all meet in Geneva at some point and have uh, a discussion inside uh, the UN building and see uh, with the, when uh, one of the bodies is meeting to have not only a panel, but also uh, a chit chat and, and have more an, an in-person opportunity to share, share ideas and contacts and come up with a more general proposal. Uh, Science for Democracy in the past has organized um, the World Congress for Freedom of Scientific Research. Many of you have participated in that, but also in other side events that we have done in Geneva. The idea would have a seventh session somewhere. Our original thought was to do it in Rome, not only because we, we are in Rome, but because FAO has a lot of things that may should include science and participation and transparency and also the promotion of uh, the right to science in places in which they don't talk about it too much, or they may have possibly a more open approach uh, when it comes to science than in other uh, venues. Vienna may be a problematic place where to talk about these things, even if we have organized side events there, but Geneva and Rome, and of course, New York, where we had a panel discussion a few years ago, uh, are places where to go and come up with proposals. But first I would suggest a strategy meeting so that we go there prepared uh, and also coordinated in a way or another. Thank you, Marco. Then on that note, I think if no one else has anything they'd like to follow up on that question, and I think Marco, I'll bring it back to you to Yes, well, only to thank each and every one of you, the panelists and the people that uh, participated until this time. Uh, at some point, we were 85, so I think it was a big success. Uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion bilaterally or multilaterally or transdisciplinary and around the world. So for now, thank you very much. If we don't see each other again, Happy New Year. <laughs>